morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Max Survey. I'm, uh, I'm the founder of uh, Strict Analytical, and I'm in the process of building up a new enterprise called Lampa Lab. Uh, and I'm getting quite a lot of assistance from the University of Chester. For, so, for, so, first of all, I just wanted to start by acknowledging thanks to people like John Fox and Cassie Chowdhury and Graham and those people at Big Bang Chester. Definitely that in helping me along the way. So, the reason why I'm talking about Halal is uh, I'm, you know, there's been quite a lot of press about Halal. Especially in the recent years, uh, and what I'm trying to do is to basically, you know, make you realise it's not—it's more than actually animal slaughter. It's more than um, more than uh, just avoiding certain types of food. You, as manufacturers, you probably have got products that are already health love compliant, and it's an understanding that are up cheap, uh, and it's understanding the markets that are available to you, which is uh, the first, which is the purpose of my talk here. So. Uh, can I ask, um, first of all, does anybody know what the definition of halal is? Can, can, oh, can, <laughs> can, can somebody give me uh, what they believe to be a definition of halal? So, so, so uh, yeah, I think um, this, this silence is basically an example of what the Muslim community needs to do to basically broaden its appeal to the term halal. Because halal generally has been associated or, you know, mainly with animal slaughter. And there's been a lot of negative press associated with that. But first and foremost, you know, the welfare of the animal is the most critical part, which is always, always, always forgotten about. So I'll stop my part of the political broadcast and so move on to some of the, some of the definitions. Can you use the, the mic? Sorry. Okay. Um, so, uh, So um, first of all, is that better? Yeah. Yeah. So so the term halal is is a term that is associated with the Muslim, with, with the Muslim community, and the uh, translation of halal, which is an Arabic term, is that it's permissible. So anything to do with behaviour, anything to do with clothing, anything to do with what you eat, anything to do with social social interaction, is basically good versus bad. Uh, if, if you want to look at it in its more simplistic form. So halal means permissible, lawful, or allowed. Whereas the opposite of halal is a term called haram. And just wanted to see how many of you have actually heard of the term haram at all? No? Well, a couple of you, so, so that's great. So, three. So, so the opposite of haram, uh, opposite of halal is haram. So it means forbidden, uh, prohibited, unlawful, condemned, or disapproved. And really, the purpose of these measures are to protect the individual consumer, but also to protect the entire chain. So it could be protection of the animal, it could be protection of, uh, of, of children, protection of communities. So it, uh, halal not only relates to food, but it also encompasses an entire Muslim lifestyle. And the uh, teachings of halal are encompassed within the Quran, which is the book of Muslims, and, that, and the Quran was revealed to the prophet, first prophet of Islam, the, young, the prophet of Islam, uh, Muhammad, in the seventh century. And Islam is the fastest growing religion in, in the world. So in terms of food, I wanted to give you some key facts about halal, and what I want to do is to give you a bit of a quiz on the next slide to see uh, what you understand as, as being halal. And halal. <coughs> so in terms of food, almost everything is halal. Uh, unless it's specifically stated, and halal can become haram under certain situations. So, for example, <coughs> an apple is is halal, but if, if you allow it to ferment, it becomes haram because it becomes alcoholic. So that's that's uh, that that's uh, that's a simple example. Aquatic animals are are always halal, and and here uh, this this is the precondition that's been set in the Quran. Uh, the common uh, animals that you would eat: chicken, lamb. Cow, deer, camel in the Middle East, for example, they're all halal up until the point of slaughter. And uh, a halal, an animal only becomes halal if the slaughterer uh, follows a certain set of very strict conditions. Again, welfare is at the foremost of, of the slaughter process. However, within the Quran itself, there are certain items that have been deemed to be haram, and these are specifically for pork, alcohol, and any residue from any of the above from non-halal sources, 
added as food ingredients and stabilizers. So that's, these are important <coughs> things to note, especially for the food industry. So um, I'd like a little bit of audience participation, please. <laughs> so I'd like uh, <coughs> to say whether, whether you think it's halal, uh, haram, or, or maybe, maybe you're not sure. So first of all, an easy one, a bacon sandwich. Haram, <laughs> 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 okay, that's fantastic. Second one, what the wine? No. No, extra. Yeah. No, uh, jelly? Yeah. No. So uh, yeah, it depends on whether it's gelatin that's been sourced from a halal slaughtered animal or a non halal slaughtered animal. Can you hear it? Or or it could actually come from come from pectin, which is totally halal, so it's, it's an animal source. So as as food manufacturers you need to be aware of some of these criteria. So here we've got a chicken burger. So is that halal, haram or maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, brilliant. And your typical Friday night curry, uh, is that likely to be halal or haram or maybe? Maybe. Supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> the majority of restaurants are owned by Muslim owners and predominantly their meat tends to be, tends to be halal. The, the chicken tends to be halal. Uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's a question that you might want to ask the owner. It's your choice as a consumer to, you know, whether you want to carry on eating at that restaurant or, or, or not. But, um, uh, I just wanted to so now take it up, take it one level further uh, because on this slide there are certain items which are halal, haram, haram or maybe. So if, if you can let me know what you think about vinegar, a table vinegar, is that halal, haram, maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Vinegar mostly is halal uh, and it's used it as one of the favourite condiments for profit and because it's consumed in small amounts. Uh, and, and it's uh, a good flavouring and it's got beneficial health properties. It, it is actually one of the ones that's deemed to be really halal. Uh, what, about, uh, what about these? These are uh, cod liver oil capsules made from coated with gelatin. Pr pr primarily they're haram, yeah. Uh, what about something which has got a vegetarian label on it? Is that is that halal or haram? Sorry? Halal. Um, this, this is one of the uh, this is one of the um, things that Muslims have, have a level, extra level of security because having a vegetarian label on it doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, it's still applicable to Muslims because this situation it actually the profiteroles actually contain uh, alcohol so that's it, that's not permissible for Muslims so uh, what you're probably getting the picture of is you know we're very we're very keen on reading the label. So what about your what about your Friday night fish and chips? Halal, haram, maybe. Depends on what fat the chips are cooked in. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I was with you last night. <laughs> <laughs> so so a lot of um, fish and chip shops that are tra uh, traditional fish and chip shops, for example, they will be using beef dripping and, and they're not they're not uh, they're not necessarily halal. Uh, Bassets of Bassets um, jelly babies, they're. Probably haram. Haram, yeah. So they contain gelatin, so they, they deem haram. Bones crisps. <laughs> Depends on the fat. Yeah. On, on, the, on the whole, they tend to be halal, but every now and again they do change, they do like seasonal packaging or they do special offers. And we have to look at the source, and then, and at that point, we do look on the back of the label to see whether it is suitable for, for suitable for vegetarians or not. So, uh, the choice of rennet that's been used, for example, is it plays a very important part. Uh, a piece of Parmesan cheese. Oh no. Oh, haram. That's mostly haram, mostly yeah. because the white particles that you see in there, that's that's pork fat, so that's uh, that's uh, not that's not allowed. Finally, cough syrup. Yeah, exactly. Um, if it contains alcohol as a as a as a base, then it's, it's around. So it's it's very important. I hope you get the understanding that um, it, halal is more complex than just having a slaughter. But if you get the ingredient, uh, if if you get the ingredient and formulation right. 
then it's opening a huge market opportunity for you. And and you might actually be doing this as manufacturers. I think the question I didn't ask is how many and how many people in this room are manufacturers? One manufacturer. <laughs> Two. And how many how many of you believe your products are not compliant? Not sure to be honest. Right. Yeah. So for your belief. So, um, again, Halal is, isn't difficult, it's just, you know, there's a certain number of codes that you need to adhere to, and, and they should open up a huge market opportunity. So, um, just to quantify the Halal market, globally it's a $3 trillion market, and Halal doesn't encompass just food, it encompasses a number of various other attributes as well. Another important fact that I wanted to highlight is Muslims, even though we're a small proportion within the UK, we do eat a lot of, lot of meat. Twenty-seven percent of all meat that's sold within the UK is consumed by, by Muslims. So, uh, uh, so, so you know, that, there's an opportunity there already. So, com companies that are aware of the halal criteria can benefit tremendously. And I just wanted to give you a breakdown of the of the uh, industries globally. So, halal food and beverages, one trillion dollars. Uh, Islamic clothing, 234 billion. Halal cosmetics and Islamic finance. And finance is uh, a growing sector. And in, in <coughs> Islam, things such as uh, interest are, are forbidden for obvious reasons. Not something with the global economy right now. So, you know, be, again, being aware of these can be uh, can give you a competitive advantage. So, all of these brands are already within within the halal market for, for one reason or another. So if you look at the likes of Tesco, for example, I was quite surprised when I walked into Tesco in Blackburn to see a fully dedicated halal counter. They are, they are, Tesco have got their own problems at the moment, but they are aware of the uh, of the huge opportunities by serving the local community. KFC, a, a significant number of their outlets within the UK are, are uh, serving halal, halal meat. Uh, uh, big multinationals such as Mar Mars, uh, Nestle, they've all got some form of halal accreditation. And uh, uh, it's what I'll do is I'll introduce the concept of accreditation at a later later stage. But uh, if, if anything is halal, it will have this Arabic lettering on there, and, and you read it read it right to left rather than left to right. But that but that sign actually means halal in Arabic. And obviously, you've got the English and the name. So as a, as a global population, um, I wanted to highlight where the hotspots are for opportunity. And uh, the map here shows that the global Muslim population currently stands at, a, at about 1.8 billion. Uh, and it's forecast to grow <coughs> at, uh, at a rate so that the global, uh, global population is going to be about 27%. So one in four people on the planet are going to be, going to be Muslim consumers. Um, the obvious markets are those in the, in the Middle East, but uh, there's also significant opportunities within uh, Indonesia, places like Indonesia, Malaysia. China's got a growing Muslim population. Russia's got an increasing Muslim population. The United States at the moment, it's, it seems to be uh, less than 10 million, but again, there's a, there's a big movement within, within the United States to, uh, to, uh, towards Islam. So just to give you a little bit of an insight into the Muslim community, consumer, they are a growing and influential but extremely loyal group. So if you are able to uh, tailor your branding and your marketing to ensure that uh, you, you maintain their loyalty, it's, it's, a, it's a massive sustainable opportunity for you as a manufacturer. So some of the uh, key motivators of Muslim communities uh, consumers, like most consumers, is you, know, you look. You look at how ethical an, an organisation is. Um, as a manufacturer, it's also useful to understand um, Islamic values, but not just put your own push your own values onto the markets. And Muslims are, you know, driven by factors such as emotionally appealing, purity, honesty, consistency, responsibility, and, and intelligence. So the if, if the marketing is tailored to um, to encompass these values, it should help you uh, develop your brands overseas. 
Uh, one thing to be aware of also is that the Muslim community consumer is very politically aware, um, and social media has proved a very powerful tool. Uh, last last year we saw, uh, we saw the Arab Spring, and uh, that was mainly spread around in, by Twitter and Facebook. Um, companies that are actively involved in oppressive regimes, they are all being, you know, they are being boycotted, but they're being sanctioned, and they're being divested. So the Muslim consumer is voting by their pocket, really, not, not to go with uh, brands which they disagree with. So as much as possible, adopt a mainstream approach to your brand to ensure long-term loyalty. So um, as I've mentioned earlier on, uh, the Muslim consumer does read the label. So ensure that um, if, if, if you want to adopt the market, key ingredients that you need to avoid are pulp, pulp gelatin, alcohol, and rennet. Gelatin, if you can say that it's sourced from halal animals, then, then that's an advantage for you because that's a huge opportunity waiting to be really exploited. Uh, there's also an increasing awareness of e-numbers amongst the Muslim communities. And having something that's suitable for vegetarians is a automatically make it suitable for food support for Muslims. So to help you help the help the manufacturer on the journey to halal acceptance, um, there are a number of accreditation bodies in, within the UK. And these are these are listed on the left and they work in the, under the umbrellas of these organizations. I just wanted to quickly uh, give you an overview of the work that we're doing with the Institute of Food Science and Innovation. And we're in the process, we're in the very early stages of putting together a global science research unit. And the aim is to actually uh, help companies enter the lucrative $3 trillion market by offering a variety of courses. And one uh, case study is, is the formation of a company called Lab Halal, which, which I'm a part of. So in conclusion, uh, the national and international uh, food market offers a significant, op op offers significant opportunity for brands to enter the lucrative market. Accreditation is important. The halal consumer is always looking to widen their, their choice of product, and, and we're here to assist you. So, acknowledgements there, and if you need any further information, please come Thanks Thank so much. Thank you. Well, that's very interesting and very informative talk. I, I know I've learned something, and I'm sure all the rest will say the same, but we'll take a few questions from Mems. Yes, Jack. Uh, you mentioned reading labels several times, and we've been in the first context of what is crisps. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you going to find out what fat they fried crisps? And gen generally, uh, we, we get that sort of information from social media. So, with the Halal Food Authority, for example, they will they will be auditing their processes. So, uh, there's a big community that follows the creditors, and we will we'll get that information from them. And what they do is actively audit the processes on a regular basis. Would would a consumer consult the social media site in order to interpret the label? Uh, not, not all the time. There's, there's an increasing there's increasing use of so, social media. What they tend to do is they they, they get reliant upon uh, word of mouth. A lot of the times, in, in certain, certain instances, actually, it's it's uh, mis 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 mythical. So, for example, there was a, a news story about Cadbury's containing pork fat recently in Malaysia. So it, that caused a whole lot of stir. But it was actually Chinese whispers. So you know, we, we have to be very, very careful about that. And anyone that's serving that market has to be aware that there may be forces out there that might be actually out there to disrupt that process. Any other questions? In which case, I say thank you very much indeed for the talk this morning.